Good morning and Merry Christmas. So great to see all of you today. George Gallup recently released the results of a poll they conducted about 2020. And there's good news and then there's bad news. So I'm going to start with the bad news. The bad news is that in this poll, they found out that the mental health of Americans in every category except one is declining. Now, here's the good news. The category in which it isn't declining is in those who attend weekly worship services. Hey, let's, let's give it up for that. In Hebrews chapter 10, 25, it may explain part of the reason why the writer of Hebrews said not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, especially in the time in which we live, because this last year was a time that wasn't for the faint of heart. It started with something that struck fear in a lot of hearts, and that was the coronavirus. It was a pandemic around the world. And I know there were fears, fears that you might contract it, fears that a loved one could die from the coronavirus. The pandemic resulted in shutdowns, which led to worry about financial crisis. Maybe I'd lose my job. Maybe uh, my retirement would be in trouble. And then, of course, that led to concerns about education shutting down. And are my children going to get a good education? Am I going to be trapped in my home with my children all year long? How am I going to educate these kids? There were a lot of worries there. And then there was the death of George Floyd, which led to worry that maybe our justice system wasn't fair and impartial with all people. And then that resulted in protests which led to riots, and then looting, and then arson, and then even murder in our streets, which led to all kinds of worries about safety and security and worry for those who served in law enforcement, that they may be a target of violence. There was a lot of worry. And then there was the fear that President Trump may be reelected. And there was the fear that Joe Biden could become our next president. And then there was fear that that could lead to socialism sweeping our country. And then there was fear that our election was not fair. And then there was fear that maybe communist China had too much influence in our country. There were all kinds of fears, real and imaginary. And others are very fearful about the coming year of 2021. You could say that this Christmas, rather than being a very merry Christmas for many, it's a very scary Christmas because of fear. Well, I want you to know, in the time in which Jesus was born, there were also a lot of fears. And in the Christmas story, we see four different people or groups of people who were fearful. And because of that, God had to give them the antidote for fear. And what they did caused an end of fear in their lives. So we're going to look at those four examples today and the four choices they made. The first one we're going to look at is Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she's going to teach us that in times of fear, we need to believe God's word. We read it in Luke 1. We're going to begin in verse 26. So if you would turn with me there or look to the screens, let me say, we're going to be reading a good deal of the Christmas story. And I love to do that. So no apologies there. It's just so fun always to read the Christmas story. But we begin in verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now angels actually are messengers, but Gabriel is a unique messenger. He is the angel that God typically sends for really significant messages. And this is sent to a woman who is in a small town called Nazareth. It was an out-of-the-way city, and it was up in the Galilee. The Galilee was the hill country in the north. And it was considered not a very good area by those who lived in Judea, and particularly those who were in Jerusalem. But that is where God is going to be active. Look at verses 27 to 28. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. She was highly favored. But that favor was going to lead to a lot of confusion and a lot of pain in her life. Verse 29. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. 
So there is an angelic appearance. And this isn't a dream. She literally, with her physical eyes, saw this angel, which would have been overwhelming. And I can imagine it being a bit fearful for this peasant girl in this out-of-the-way place. Verse 30 goes on. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid. So he is dealing with Mary's fear in this moment. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He'll be great, and he'll be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Now, Mary was a very special lady. She had a very humble spirit. She had a heart after God. But notice, the angel doesn't tell her how great she was, but how great the son is that she's going to have. He's going to be the son of the highest. He is going to be the son of God. And it's really interesting that he's going to sit on the throne of his father, David, because both through Mary and through his stepfather, Joseph, their uh, genealogy, their lineage goes all the way back to King David who was the one through whom the Messiah was going to come. Now, here's what's interesting to me. Had it been an earlier time in their history, it would have been Jesus who was sitting on the throne in Israel. Instead, you have King Herod who was appointed there, and he was an Edomite. Look at verse 33. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. This is speaking of the fact that Jesus is going to sit on David's throne during the millennial reign. Verse 34, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? Now that's a great question because she's being told something absolutely impossible. And sometimes God tells us things that seem absolutely impossible. He tells us that in this unholy world, we're to live holy lives. In fact, we're to be holy as he's holy. And we say, Lord, how can that be? (laughs) Or, Or maybe it is that he's saying, you need to forgive that person who wrongs you. And you're saying, God, after what they did to me, how can that be? Or maybe God has spoken to your heart and said, you're going to be a difference maker in this world. And you say, well, Lord, you know me. How can that be? That's what this is about. Mary's saying, how is this even possible? Look at verse 35. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who's to be born will be called the Son of God. Now that always just absolutely grips me. That God became a man through incarnation that God became a man and walked and made footprints in our sand, breathed our oxygen, lived among us, that God became one of us. That's absolutely stunning. How was it possible? By a miracle of the Holy Spirit. And how are you and I going to fulfill the will and purpose of God for our lives? By the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not by our might or by our power, but it's by the power of the Spirit. We have to be people dependent upon the Spirit because what God has called us to be and do is a miracle apart from the Holy Spirit. So just like Mary totally needed the Holy Spirit to do this, it's the only way in our own lives we need the Holy Spirit. So how does Mary respond? Look at verses 36 and 37. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, this was her older cousin, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this now is the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. I love the way the 1901 NAS translation puts it. For no word of God shall be void of power. God's word is powerful. Jeremiah 1.12 says that God watches over his word to perform it. When God says something, it's going to come to pass. He's going to do it. Verse 38. Then Mary said, behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So how did Mary overcome her fears? She believed the word of God. There are 7,000 promises in God's word. And what God asks us to do is simply to believe them, to trust his promises, to believe what he said. And I want to let you know that God's promises are true no matter what you're facing. 
Maybe it's been a very difficult financial season. Maybe you're looking ahead and saying you have great concerns. But remember, he said he'd meet your every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Maybe you feel forsaken and alone during this time. And that can be very difficult. But the Lord said he will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And his presence can be very real and very tangible in your life during this time. His power is also available through any hardship, any difficulty. He gives us the ability to cope, to deal, to overcome, to be more than conquerors in any situation. Those are God's promises that we need to cling to. We must be like Mary and believe what God has said. The second courageous choice we see comes in the life of Joseph, Mary's fiance, and who is going to be the stepfather of Jesus. And so we read what Joseph did, and that was simply that he obeyed God's word. In the middle of his fears, he obeyed what God told him to do. We read it in Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. So Mary and Joseph are betrothed. Now, that's like our engagement only it was much stronger. If you made that kind of commitment to end it, it actually was considered a divorce. Look at verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Now, I want you to think about Joseph. What a difficult position you'd be in. What a difficult position Mary would be in. She has to come and say, I'm pregnant. It's kind of like I did earlier. There's the good news and the bad news. The bad news, I'm pregnant. The good news is, it's the Holy Spirit. This was God. God did it. There was nobody else involved in this but God. Now, how do you handle that if you're Joseph? Well, of course, he didn't believe it. How is that even possible? There's no way. This is crazy. And what he could have done is he could have publicly shamed her, but he didn't. Instead, he protected her. He was really a good man with a wonderful heart who really loved this young girl despite what happened. Look at verse 20. But while he thought about these things, and you can imagine, it must have absolutely consumed his mind thinking about this. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. This time it's not physically in front of Mary, but it's in the dream of Joseph, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. There it is again. In the middle of his fears, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Dreams in the Bible are very significant, and people took them very seriously. Now, I know for me, I can tend to be a dreamer. Uh, especially in the mornings. It seems like if I wake up in the morning, I almost always have some kind of dream that I'm going through. But almost always, they mean nothing but silliness and nonsense. And sometimes I'll even say, Lord, are you speaking to me? And immediately I think, of course he's not. That's absolutely crazy what you're dreaming about tonight. But there are times when God will speak to us through our dreams. Do you realize that right now the fastest growing church in the world is in the Muslim country of Iran? And there in Iran, God is appearing to these Muslim people in their dreams. Esau is coming to them. Jesus is coming to them in their dreams. And they're being shaken by it. And they'll go and they'll look for a Christian who shares with them the gospel. And that's how the great majority of Muslims are coming to Christ right now through these dreams. Now, Joseph has had a dream that has told him to go ahead and marry this woman that he loves, but has had this incredible story told to him. And I can somewhat relate to that because uh, I got married a little later than some. Uh, I met my wife, Kelly, when I was 30 years old. And I hadn't been married to that point because I was waiting for the right person. But part of it was, for me, I probably had unrealistic standards in a wife. But when Kelly came along, I thought, this is her. This is the one I've been waiting for. However, at 30 years old, and being a very confirmed bachelor at that point, as it got closer to where I knew I was going to have to either break it off or ask her to marry me, I started to get cold feet, and I wasn't sure. And so one night, God gave me a dream. And in this dream, this very well-known woman teacher 
was teaching the Bible in a conference and I was sitting in the auditorium and I'm listening to her. And she says, some of you men are so fearful and you're afraid to get married. And she said, that's nonsense. You need to step out of it, have a little bit of courage and marry that woman or you're not gonna fulfill your destiny. Well, I woke up and asked Kelly to marry me. So I, I can somewhat relate to that. God will sometimes speak to us in our dreams. Look at verse 20. That while he thought about these things, while he thought about these things, an angel appeared to him and he told him all these things. Look down in verse 21. And she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Now the name Jesus is the Old Testament equivalent to Joshua. And it means the Lord our Savior or the Lord our salvation. Verses 22 and 23. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. That's Isaiah 7.14 that's being quoted here that God prophesied that Someday, God would become a man and he would be among us. Verse 24. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. So what does Joseph do in the middle of his fears? He obeys God. He does what God tells him to do. And let me say, I know without a doubt that either Online right now, those watching or those who are at one of our campuses right now at Central or Woodland Park or someone in this auditorium today or maybe even later on the radio is listening to this, that there is something God has told you to do and you just haven't done it yet. Maybe you're fearful for the consequences. I've been there before. I've had God tell me to do something, and I knew it was the Lord speaking to me, either through his word or just the witness of the spirit that I was to do something, but to do it made me afraid because I knew the consequences that could happen if I did it. I knew the ramifications if things didn't go the way I'd hoped they would, but I stepped out and obeyed God, and it was so interesting. When you step out and obey God, it's the death of fear. It's amazing. When you step out to do what he said, fear begins to diminish. And that's exactly what Joseph did. And that's a lesson we can all learn, is when we're fearful, obey God. Do what God has told you. Now let's look at the third example of a courageous choice, and that comes from the shepherds. They chose, in the middle of their fear, to worship and to praise God. Let's look at it in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now shepherds in that day were considered outcasts. Because of the ceremonial laws, they were often unclean because of the work they did. And so they weren't considered much in our society. Folks, there is nothing called insignificant people. All people are important. All people are made in the image of God. And I want to challenge all of us. Everybody we come in contact with, we need to treat as made in the image of God and treat them with respect and treat them with love and encouragement. And it's so, it's so easy to simply reach out with your words of affirmation and love. And I encourage all of us to do this during the Christmas season, particularly those who maybe feel like they're in the lower rungs of society or aren't as significant. And that's exactly what God is doing for these shepherds. Look at verse nine. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And listen to this. They were greatly afraid. They were greatly afraid. This always reminds me of the story of the first grader who was going to be in a Christmas pageant, and he was going to be the angel. And he had one line, and his line was this, it is I, be not afraid. So he and his mom worked on it day after day. It is I, be not afraid. It is I, be not afraid. Well, the day of the pageant came. He was ready to go. He goes out on the stage. The spotlight comes on, and he freezes up. And he says, it's me, and I'm scared to death. <laughs> and a lot of us can relate to that. 
A lot of times we can become fearful, particularly when we're in the manifest presence of God, in the tangible presence of God, when we know that God is in the middle of a situation. You see that in the Bible all the time. In Isaiah, Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up in Isaiah 6, and his train filled the temple. And what did Isaiah say? Woe is me. (laughs) I'm a man of unclean lips, dwelling among a people of unclean lips. Or I think about Simon Peter. Do you remember uh, he is out on his boat, and Jesus tells him to throw his net on the other side, and there's this miracle catch that could only be a miracle of God. And Peter realizes, I'm standing in the presence of somebody very special. Maybe even he recognized this person is divine. And he says, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. And we can feel like that. You know, God, I'm unworthy. I'm not enough. I'm I'm so sorry for all of my failures. But it's so interesting that they're told to exchange great fear for great joy. Because despite being who they were, God was going to use them. And let me tell you, despite who you are and who I am, God will use us. And God was going to use them to go and share this message of the birth of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 11. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This actually is one of my favorite Christmas passages. I want to read that end of it to you again. A Savior who is Christ the Lord tells us exactly who Jesus was. First of all, he's a savior. In fact, I would say he's the only savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I think about Peter when he said that there's no other name under heaven by which you may be saved. And we can be almost embarrassed by that in our pluralistic society, that Jesus is the only way. But I wanna let you know, he's the only savior. He's the only means of salvation. Then he's Messiah. The word there, Christ, is a Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. Now, who was the Messiah? The Messiah was to be David's son. He was the one who was to come and redeem the human race. In fact, he was the rescuer. Goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. When mankind is told there's one coming who's going to crush the head of the serpent. He was the seed of David. He was the seed of Abraham. He was the one who was going to fulfill all the Old Testament promises. Do you realize that there were so many promises of the Old Testament about the Messiah, and Jesus fulfilled every one of them? He is Israel's Messiah. Many of the Jews are still waiting for a Messiah to come, but let me tell you, the Messiah has already come. His name is Jesus, and he's coming again. And finally, he's Lord. He's Lord of the universe. And that day, they were to say that Caesar was Lord, that Caesar was king. Well, these angels are pronouncing the true Lord, the true king, is Jesus Christ. And there's coming a day, according to Philippians 2, Paul tells us when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he's the only Savior, he is Israel's Messiah, and he's the Lord of the universe, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 12. It says, and this will be the sign to you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angel had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying, which was told them concerning that child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Now look at verse 20. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Now how did they overcome their fear? Through praise and worship. They left glorifying and giving praise to God. They also were in the presence of the angels as they praised and worshiped God. There is something incredibly powerful about worship. The Bible tells us that praise stills or stops the enemy and the avenger. 
And many of us feel like we walk in darkness sometimes, that there are attacks on our life that we're being tormented and attacked by the darkness. But I want to let you know the antidote to that is praise. In fact, I would say the antidote to worry is worship. The antidote to panic is praise. That when we praise and worship God, something incredible happens. I know that just listening to worship music can be very powerful in my life and steady my spirit and calm my soul. I love this time of year, and one of the reasons I like it so much is you'll go into these secular stores where you never hear the name of Jesus, and they're playing Christmas carols that glorify and exalt the name of Jesus. I absolutely love that. For me, I think it's very helpful when I'm going through a time that I could feel fearful to listen to a lot of praise and worship music. And more than that, to myself, take time to worship and praise God in the midst of, and even despite, and in fact, sometimes to front my fears, to come before my fears and say, no, there's a God that's greater. There's a God that's more powerful. There's a God that's able to do far more than anything you can do to me. That is how we respond to fear. We worship and praise God. And I want to challenge you, whatever you're facing today, whatever that fear may be, turn your back on the fear, face God, and begin to worship and praise him. That is a key throughout the scripture, where people in the middle of their fears, in the middle of their concerns, in the middle of their difficult situations, turn their back on those things and simply worship God and give him glory. And I say every day, let's take time to give him glory. You know, if we don't have anything else to praise him for, we can praise him for Jesus, because he is indeed the Savior, the Messiah, and the Lord. So let's get to the final way that people dealt with their fears. And this final one is very interesting because it involves Zechariah. How did he handle his fears? Well, really, they were handled for him. And that is to guard your heart and to guard your mouth. In the middle of a fearful time, we need to guard our heart and we need to guard our mouth. And we see that in the life of Zechariah. Zechariah was uh, married to Elizabeth, who was the cousin of Mary. And Zechariah was getting a little older in years, and so was his wife, and they'd never had children. And so we read in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 11, his story. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Now, Zechariah was a priest, and periodically, the priests were allowed to go into the holy place. Now, if you remember your temple, which this would have been the temple in Jerusalem that he went to, there was an outer court, but then you would enter into what was known as the holy place, which was just in front of the Holy of Holies. And in the holy place, there was an altar of incense, and he was supposed to minister or serve at the altar of incense. He was to offer incense. This was quite a privilege and an amazing responsibility. And while he's there, an angel appears to him. Look at verse 13. Because he's gripped with fear, and the angel said to him, do not be afraid. There it is again. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard. Now his prayer clearly was that he would have a child and probably a son. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, verses 18 to 20. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I'm Gabriel, there's Gabriel again, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. And behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which we will be fulfilled in their time. Now, here's what's interesting. Both Zechariah and Mary responded in a very similar way. But Mary responded in faith where Zechariah responded in fear and unbelief. I want you to think about it. When Mary heard the announcement that she was going to give birth to this miracle child, she said, how can this be? And her recognition is God's going to do it. I have faith that God will do what he said, but, but how's it even possible? What Zechariah is saying is it's not possible. 
There's no way this can happen. How could this possibly be? There's no way. And so God rebukes him. But God is also very kind to him. He doesn't allow him to speak. Because he doesn't want him speaking doubt, unbelief, and fear. (laughs) And many times, I think it'd be good if God made us mute for a season of time. Because so many of us tend to speak so much doubt, unbelief, and fear. You know, God makes us a promise. We see the promise, and then we question it. But we don't question it in faith. We question it in fear and unbelief. How could this be? How could this ever happen? And so many of us speak to ourselves, first of all, about ourselves in very negative ways. I'm no good. I'll never amount to anything. God could never use me. And and God doesn't want us to speak to ourselves that way. He wants us to speak words of faith over ourselves. And other times we speak about God in a very derogatory way. God, you never come through. God, you don't answer my prayers. God, when are you ever going to do anything? Folks, that is very damaging because God does not work in an atmosphere of fear and unbelief. He works in an atmosphere of faith. And so instead of God making us mute, he simply challenges us to speak his word instead of speaking the words of doubt and unbelief. And life can get tough and it can get fearful. And it's very easy to fall into unbelief. I think about those who were taken into Babylonian captivity and they were in exile and they were very despondent because God had made many problems, promises about Jerusalem and Jerusalem looked like it'd never be rebuilt. So they were despondent. And I love the psalmist when he said, why are thou cast down, O my soul? He said, why am I like I am? Why am I disquieted in me? Then he said, hope in God, hope in God for I will yet praise him. And we have to do that. We have to talk to ourselves and say, you're going to believe God. You're going to trust God. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care how you feel. You're going to trust God. You're going to believe God. And you're going to speak words of faith instead of words of doubt and unbelief. And words of faith are simply saying what God said himself. Declaring God's word even when it doesn't look possible. Declaring God's word even when it hasn't happened yet to speak words of faith instead of words of doubt. I think about David and Goliath. What a wonderful story that is. I know all of us are familiar with that story. We see it over in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I think about Goliath, this giant of a man. He comes down into the valley of Elah. And there he begins to pronounce over Israel. You could say he was giving them the news that day. And he was telling them that your God can do nothing. That I am going to defeat you and I'm going to destroy you and just send a man down here. And then we the Philistines are going to completely overwhelm you. That was the news report. You know, a lot of us spend too much time listening to the news. (laughs) You know, to me, you shouldn't be like an ostrich with your head in the sand. It always bothers me when people don't know anything about what's going on in our world. We need to know what's going on. But then there's other people that instead of spending time in God's word, they're spending time listening to the news all the time. And most of the news is negative. (laughs) And it speaks to our fears and it speaks to our doubts and it speaks to our worries and it speaks to our concerns. For some of you, the best thing you could do is to limit how much news you listen to and instead spend more time listening to what God says and hearing what he says and meditating on his word. And that's what David did. You know, Israel's been hearing this bad news day after day, and they're terrified. They're in absolute paralysis. But David shows up, and he hasn't been listening to the news. He's been meditating on the Psalms. And he hears what Goliath says, and he says, who is this guy? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine to speak that way about the armies of the living God? That simply meant he didn't have any covenant with God, but they had a covenant with God. And then he tells Goliath what he's going to do. I am going to cut off your head, and I'm going to feed your body to the birds. (laughs) He was speaking words of faith. And sure enough, he goes out, and he does exactly what he said. He defeats Goliath, cuts off his head, and all of a sudden, everything changes. The fear that had been in Israel jumped across the valley and got into the Philistines. And the faith that was in David jumped back and got into Israel, and they began to pursue them and have a great victory. Folks, let me tell you, faith and fear are both contagious. And if you're constantly listening to things that are fearful, if you're constantly around people that are fearful and worried and uptight and afraid and doubting and questioning, you're going to tend to be that way. 
So we need to really look at what inputs we have in our life and choose to surround ourselves with faith and encouragement and expectation in God because our God is faithful. And so I want to challenge all of us. I don't know where you're at, but I want to challenge all of us because all of us have the tendency to fall into fear and to fall into worry and to even become panicked. But I want to remind you what Mary did. Mary simply believed the word of God. I want to remind you what Joseph did. Joseph stepped out to obey the word of God. And some of you need to do that today. You need to do what God has been telling you to do. Or I think about the shepherds who praised and worshiped God. Let's all spend some time focusing on him instead of focusing on our problems and our fears. And then finally, David. And David, and he was following, uh, David uh, was being followed by Zechariah. And Zechariah was one who was made mute. But though we're not made mute, we make the decision to be like David and fill ourselves with words of faith and expectation and watch what we're saying and watch what we're listening to and instead fill our heart with faith. So we've been sufficiently challenged by God's word today as we go into this Christmas season. So let's pray together. Father, I pray for every one of us. I pray today for those who are feeling fearful, those who have real fears and even imaginary fears about what the future holds, that we would not be filled with anxiety and worry and fear, but instead, Lord, we would believe you, we would obey you, that we would worship you, and we would choose to think on those things, as Paul said, that are lovely, just, pure, virtuous, worthy of praise, those things that fill us with faith and hope and expectation. And Father, I ask you to do that in each one of us during this Christmas season. And Father, I I think of the hymn that says all of our hopes and fears are seen in him tonight. They're They're all dealt with through Jesus. They're all handled through Jesus. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in him tonight. Lord, we thank you that you are the answer to our fear. You are the answer to our worry. You are the answer to our concerns. And so, Lord, we take all of these things to you, and we choose to obey you. In Jesus' name, amen.